ladies and gentlemen. Indifference is a green light for hatred and violence. On a recent visit to Norway, I visited the Narvik War Museum. And at the beginning of the tour, I read these words on the wall describing the mood in the country in 1940. War will never come to Norway. Keep Norway out of war. Yet, as the exhibition proceeded, these introductionary words were not followed by the years of peace the people of Norway had desired. Instead, we plunged into the depths of the Battle of Narvik, which spread from the fuse in front of the city into the surrounding mountains. By June of that year, Hitler's troops had captured Narvik. German occupation would last for years, during which time freedom of speech was only a distant memory. When the Norwegians still lived in hope that they could avoid everything that was going to happen, Germany had already decided to conquer Norway. They needed the year-round port of Narvik to transport iron ore from Sweden, and besides, Norwegians were considered Aryan and thus desirable for the reinvigoration of the German race. Norway never could have remained neutral as it so desperately wanted, because Germany had no intention of respecting its sovereignty. Similar words, sentiments, and beliefs have been repeated with regrettable regularity throughout history. People always want to believe that conflicts occurring outside their own borders won't affect them. Even as war wages in neighboring territories, they cling to this belief, but it never protects them. What should we call this persistent need to believe that things Bad things won't cross our own threshold. Perhaps we could call it naivety, gullibility, or a lack of imagination. People close their eyes time and time again to things that happen to others, imagining that it doesn't affect us, just them, those people who are somehow other, different, foreign. This also occurred in the West when Russia began to carry out information and influence operations in the Baltic countries in the early 2000s, focusing on messages meant to degrade the sovereignty of the nation in question and their right to record their own histories. Russia attacked the facts of the history of the Baltic occupations because those facts were unfavorable for Russia and need not fit the great Russian narrative, the only identity story that still unites Russians from generation to generation, the myth of the great patriotic war and its victory. Russian agitators also began to appear in other countries and gradually their activities became more visible. They denied the deportations, mocked the victims, and questioned the memories of what had happened, slandering and persecuting anyone who spoke up, along with entire countries whose independence they declared invalid. They recruited people, formed groups, uh, manufactured fake news, set up YouTube channels, blogs, book publishers, and saw their publications reviewed in the media. They participated in television interviews in Russia and in their home countries. Russian-affiliated actors in Finland marketed their wares at Helsinki Book Fair, took out ads in national newspapers, organized public events and demonstrations, issued press releases, brought like-minded guests to people, arranged for their publications to be distributed through normal bookselling channels. They even managed to have their materials used in university instruction because their group included a lecturer and docent. Nothing of this sort would be tolerated for Holocaust deniers for a good reason. And yet the Baltic countries found that attacks directed at them were treated differently. From the perspective of the Baltic states, this tolerance did not inspire confidence in the Finnish media, which believed it was only pursuing the truth. And I'm not arguing that the Finnish media does not seek the truth or does not adhere to journalists' ethical standards, but journalists are people. Phenomena that they are unfamiliar with or outside of one's experience can be difficult to recognize. And yet, demagoguery is a crime in Finland. 
But if the ethnic group that has become the victim of this crime cannot trust Finnish law, this inevitably undermines faith in the Finnish state. Immigrants and seasonal workers from Estonia make up a large group in Finland, so this issue affects a significant portion of the population, and other immigrants with roots in Eastern Europe and Russia have also taken note of the signals being given by Finland and Russia in their handling of this issue. One of the aims of pro-Russia activists was in fact to weaken to trust of these countries and people in Finland as a state and in the Finnish media. They sought to drive wedges between ethnic groups, feeding internal discord both in Finland and Estonia and between Finland and Estonia. Their goal was to destabilize the nations along their border and to bolster the mythology of Russia. For years, the rest of the West imagined that the smear campaigns targeting the Baltic states and people who wrote about them didn't affect anyone else. Finland did not believe that Russia, with which we were assured we had good relations, would ever use the same methods against Finland. And we hoped that if we could just keep quiet enough, Russia would never turn its tools of defamation and fact distortion on us. But playing dead rarely helps in situations like these. After the Baltic states, Finland, which also shares a border with Russia, was subjected to the same measures. And in recent years, Finland has also been obliged to defend its right to write its own history. When I began my career as an author, writing about issues related to Russia in 2003, the world was still a little different. Russia was already active in Baltic states, uh, but their activities were not yet visible to wider public in Finland, and Russia's methods were still being refined. The older generation who were so skilled at influenced operations during the Soviet period were just training future operatives, and their techniques were still taking shape. However, the situation quickly changed as President Putin solidified power, and I found that dealing with certain issues always seemed to attract the same strange comments. Noteworthy in this uh, rhetoric of these pro-Russia actors was the abundant use and endless repetition of Soviet ter terminology, as well as gendered and ad hominem language. For example, Blog posts from Putin acti activists insinuated that they'd been in contact with my friends and learned all sorts of personal details about me, even though they hadn't talked to anyone at all. This was gendered in that sense that they made claims or expressed fantasies about my sexuality, a pattern that was also on display in a situation where activists from various groups attended discussions about Russia at Helsinki Book Fair and videoed the legs of the female participants from the front of the stage to post on YouTube. Over the years, agitators have also showed up at my book events abroad. Particularly worth mentioning are the ones who blend in into the crowd and queue up for signatures along with everyone else until they reach the signing table and begin delivering tirades in support of Soviet narratives. A few years ago, uh, at the Frankfurt Book Fair, just before I was set to speak, a Finnish-speaking but non-Finnish individual tracked me down, and coming up very close physically, he began to rattle off a whole litany of false pro-Russia claims about Estonia. Of course, none of the Germans around me understood what was going on. So this goes far beyond the hate speech we see in the digital world. It also occurs in real life. One of the most visible incidents was a public event held in Helsinki in 2010 uh, to mark the release of a book on a recent history of Estonia edited by me and Imbi Bayu named Kaiken Takanali Pelko or Fear Behind Us All. The launch event turned into a carnival of different groups wandering around with banners and placards. When Finnish reporters interviewed the protesters that had arrived from St. Petersburg, 
the protesters didn't quite know against what or whom they were protesting. And at the same time, President Putin's party, United Russia, organized a press conference in Helsinki to express concern about the book's alleged Russophobia. The multi-channel and multimodal phenomenon created around this book was not defined in terms of information warfare at the time at all, because the language was still foreign to Finns. Since then, disinformation masquerading as a legitimate criticism has been manufactured about the translations of my books, traveling from one country and media landscape to another, and multiplying along the way. This isn't particularly difficult to accomplish, since few editorial rooms read all the books written about in their publications, and freelancers are frequently used, meaning that the rest of the editorial staff may not necessarily notice that a piece has ended up in a, their publication claiming things about my books that don't actually happen in them. The goal of these activities is the same regardless of the method to confuse the target, to waste their time figuring out what's going on and to exhaust the target as well as propagating lies about the subject, of course. Hate speech is only one tool in a wide repertoire that seeks to silence people who write about Russia. But it's especially effective because it resonates with things already lurking in the society, such as misogyny and racism. Also typical of these efforts is the planting of rumors about one's mental health, which in the case of creative people resonates in society with myths already prevalent about artists. Being stigmatized as crazy and balanced or obsessive is all in a day's work if you write about Russia. It's worth mentioning that for artists, authors, journalists, as in any other profession, it is commonplace to specialize in one or two subjects, and usually it is precisely this immersion that makes a professional a professional, an expert. In my own training as a playwright, I was encouraged to choose my own subject and to delve deeply into it. So when I put these lessons of my education into action relative to Russia, in the minds of pro-Russia activists, this deep study is a sign of insanity or obsession, possibly mixed with some sort of animosity. It's hard to imagine, say, a writer who deals with the colonial past of Great Britain rece receiving this kind of fake feedback, or that an author who has written several books about Holocaust would be accused of Germanophobia or being obsessed with Germany, let alone that her motive for writing would be revenge-seeking, for instance. But things are different with Russia. Russia has a lengthy history of labeling artists, intellectuals, and others it considers difficult as crazy, and the state is strong supporter of political psychiatry. This branch of pseudo-psychiatry developed by the Soviet Union during the detente period operated hand in hand with their other influence operations. The political psychiatry practiced by the Soviet Union is worth mentioning here because it was created after the death of Stalin uh, especially to silence dissidents and anyone who revealed facts that could disturb the prevailing order. Because the Gulag system was being dismantled and the Soviets wanted to send a message to the rest of the world that they respected human rights, they needed a new system of punishment to isolate people they saw as problematic, while also undermining the evidence they revealed of corruption, for example. Euphemistically labeled special psychiatry, it was assigned to the Minister of Interior, not the Minister of Health. The Russian Center for Forensic Medicine, the Serbsky Institute, was a focal point of this punitive special psychiatry during the Soviet period, and it continues to fabricate the most imaginative tales to the day. Uh, according to the pseudoscience of the Institute, a mass poisoning of Chechen school children was caused by a psycho-emotional stress, and evaluations of the mental health of members of the opposition can include questions such as, what do you think about President Putin? 
And journalists and researchers living elsewhere can also be labeled insane or unbalanced. And questions are raised about their expertise and existing stigmas around mental health disorders are exploited. Pro-Russia activists appeal to popular stereotypes, homophobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and misogyny to recruit other people, seeking out communities that are already receptive in some way. For example, in the United States, the same Russia-linked actors who helped President Trump to win the elec election in 2016, uh, they were also active in online anti-vaccine communities, which may seem strange at first. What do Russian internet trolls have to do with measles in America or even in Europe? Why is Moscow interested in that? The central objective of the thought control being projected from Russia into the West is to undermine confidence in the democratic system and, if possible, its actual operation. Anything that weakens democracy will do. So it isn't that Moscow is interested in measles, but rather in the target group who happen to be against vaccines. David Broniatowski, a professor at a Washington, uh, George Washington University in Washington, D.C., has been studying the activities of Russia Troll Factory, the Internet Research Agency, since 2014, and how it has weakened public confidence in vaccines and shattered consensus about their importance in the United States. Bronyazovsky found no evidence that the trolls had tried to weaken Western democracies by convincing people not to vaccinate their children, but rather by doing something else entirely. The trolls disguise themselves as ordinary users and express sympathy for anti-vaxxers in order to build credibility within the group. In this way, the trolls promote political polarization. A similar approach works with other su su subject areas that fit the agenda. After gaining credibility and followers in the community, the trolls begin to work new topics into the conversation, which their followers then begin to share. A group of people prone to anti-vaccine sentiments is only a gateway through which they are able to spread the me other messages all while enhancing the divisions that weaken democracy. The measles epidemics, of which there have been many in the United States, are just byproducts of the operation. The orchestration of these operations to sow chaos in other countries is also detrimental to health and the climate because naturally they practice the same activities among climate skeptics. In the same way, Russia has an interest in infiltrating communities that express anti-immigrant sentiments, anti-Americanism, and misogyny phenomena that already exist in our society because hate speech wells up from conflicts already present in the society. The actions of Russia feed these conflicts, acting as an amplifier for those whom volume it wishes to increase. However, hate speech is precisely the element of the Russian repertoire that every person can influence. It is also a phenomenon that has implications for the well-being of all. Now, in 2020, the names for the tools these pro-Russia agitators have been using since the early 2000s are becoming familiar to general public, shaming, doxing, hate speech, demagoguery, disinformation, fake news. And Finnish courts have even handed down judgments against people who have directed these actions against journalists. So positive developments are happening. But at first, very few were willing to defend the targets of attacks and one reason for this were the myths Russia has been cultivating since the Soviet period. In the opinion of Russia, the countries of Eastern Europe and the Baltics are, are its dependencies, so intervening in their affairs is not only justified but natural. Thinking in terms of spheres of influence in this way has its roots in World War II and the years of Soviet hegemony. But spheres of influence are just colonialism by another name and incompatible with this millennium. And few people would approve of such actions relative in other former colonial powers. 
However, for Russia, it has been tolerated, and this indulgence has served to stretch the notion of what Russia is allowed to do. No one ever gave Russia a red light. Politicians were only happy, uh, too happy to make statements about how Russia was on the road to democracy, and some of them even had economic interest in the country. The warm relationships and economic ties of many far-right politicians to Russia have since been exposed. Because information warfare is an integral part of Russian war doctrine and psychological operations represent a holistic modus operandi. These operations are carried out by civilians, political activists, the mass media, and the Russian government. And according to Russian military doctrine, operations must be carried out by using artists, diplomats, experts, journalists, authors, publishers, interpreters, communication experts, hackers, IT industry specialists. Because of the spectrum and the skills of content producing profession is so wide, penetration of these messages in the free media is inevitable unless Western, Western media seizes entirely things such as quoting the Russian state leadership. These operations take advantage of old myths, just like hate speech draws strength from Asian conflicts. And these myths are re reinforced in the Western media by the things politicians say. However, myths can always be dispelled, as has already been done in relation to numerous falsehoods about women and people of color. So why does it feel so impossible to do the same thing to comments from Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, who propagates the myths about Russia so effectively, even though this is exactly how Russia takes advantage of the Western media for its own purposes? Myths lose their power when they are deconstructed, given context, analyzed. For example, the greatness and unpredictability of Russia are myths that justify Russian aggression despite being comparable to myths about so-called darkness of Africa or stereotypes about um, inability to take risk of women leaders. The careless repetition of these myths in everyday speech normalizes them. In reality, Russia may be a large area geography, but so are Greenland and Mongolia. Geographic size doesn't make any country great. And Russia isn't unpredictable at all, because Russia's information operators are straight out of the disinformation handbook. It's a subject you can study, not some mysterious occult science. Myths and euphemisms are often intertwined, and even Finnish decision makers often emphasize the necessity of dialogue with Russia. But so-called dialogue is always a euphemism in this context, because dialogue means a reciprocal discussion. But activities aimed at encouraging hate speech and psychological manipulation are not reciprocal. Their purpose is not to seek truth. So when we talk about the importance of dialogue with Russia, actually what we mean is a negotiation, usually one involving economic interests. Or possibly what is going on is a mediation, a term familiar from legal proceedings that may be more precise expression for this conduct, but dialogue, natural discussion, it certainly is not. So why use a word that fails so thoroughly to correspond with reality? Words and word usage are at the heart of Russia's activities, and they should also be at the center of our psychological defenses. Clarity of thought, precision of expression, and the facts are weapons that can defend us from Russian actions aimed at sowing chaos. The fact that Western countries voluntarily use euphemisms that advance the interests of Russia undermines our re resilience. During the Soviet era, the people who lived in occupied territories were forced to develop euphemisms for things that were dangerous to talk about publicly. Then it was a defense mechanism that allowed people to deal with things that otherwise they would have had to keep silent about. So, but when Soviet Union crumbled, people consciously sought to dispel these euphemisms, reforming their languages and beginning to use precise expressions that matched up with reality. 
the citizens of these countries had already experienced what the alternative reality created by Soviet Union signified, and Moscow's interest in creating such a world has not disappeared. At this very moment, Russia is trying to create a new reality beyond its own borders. Not until the Ukrainian revolution of dignity turned into a war did changes begin in Western attitudes, and the press began to use the word war for the war in Ukraine instead of conflict. After Donald Trump became president, it became clear that Russia had meddled with the U.S. election, Brexit, and many other things in countries that are not Eastern Europe, the Baltic States, or any other others. And certainly this issue affected all the countries it wasn't supposed to affect, the ones that aren't others in Europe, meaning Eastern Europe and politics. The Second World War drew in one country after another, and now state after state has been targeted by Russian attempts to foster division. This should not have come as a surprise to anyone, because there have been plenty of warning signs, and targets of previous attacks had warned us. Other countries simply didn't believe that this issue would concern them. And some of them were naive. Some wanted to shut their eyes. Some were worried about the trade with Russia. When nations averted their gaze, it was like leaving someone alone who is being bullied or harassed. The silence gave the implicit understanding that the victim must have done something to deserve such treatment. Surely something. And that's exactly how hate speech works. It seeks to debase the target, to blame them in order to paralyze them and reinforce the message that the target is blame for the situation. But democracy is based on participation, and hate speech reduces participation, which is why it is dangerous, and over the long run, it leads to tyranny. The silencing and self-centering effect of hate speech on news and public debate also extends to political decision-making because hate speech attempts to disrupt the work of judiciary and public officials. In participation in society, if participation in society comes to look like a risk and leads to threats of rape and murder or threats against loved ones or false accusations, it is clear that dropping out of social activities can seem like a viable option. And this has particularly strong impacts on women and people of migrant heritage. Subjects particularly likely to fuel the hate speech are migration and Russia. When we close our eyes to hate speech and its consequences, I call it indifference. Gallows for journalists don't just fall out of sky. Writers and bloggers don't end up in prison or mental institutions for political reasons by accident. Concentration camps and genocides are always the result of long-term developments. They are preceded by a long road, every centimeter of which has blurred the lines about what is white and what is black, and at the very beginning of the road is a person who turned their eyes away, imagining that this could never touch them, and as they did so, they gave green light to hatred and violence. Indifference is one of the greatest threats to democracy and freedom of speech, and recognizing it is not as easy as you might think. Indifference has many phases, many codes, many suits of camouflage, and it manifests itself differently at different times and in different situations. Sometimes it's just turning a blind eye, sometimes clearly turning away, sometimes joy that thank God my family and I aren't mixed up with that. But that doesn't change the fact that, in the final analysis, it is indifference. And I use the word indifference for these different reactions because it is not a euphemism and because almost no one wants to think of them as indifferent. That isn't the team people want to be in. And uh, not even when their actions show that they actually are indifferent or opportunist or lackeys unconcerned with morality, with right and wrong. The historian Timothy Snyder reminds us that after the Second World War, the West actively built up myths in opposition to Hitler. But in the 1930s, the prevailing attitude was one of appeasement and admiration. 
By 1940, most Europeans had made their peace with a victorious and attractive Germany, but now we admire those who were considered unusual or insane in their own day, the ones who opposed totalitarianism, the ones who did so despite the hate speech, hate speech persecution, humiliation, the ones who defended the victims of hate campaigns, the ones who were not indifferent. Hate speech is not a new, new thing at all, and totalitarian systems have always been able to use it as a tool. It is one of the cornerstones of states that draw their strength from opposition to enemies and the fuel for the messengers who talk, walk the road to genocide. The humanity of the enemy must be erased, so targets are depicted as dirty, sexually suspect, reduced to the status of animals, ultimately insects, or some other pests who dis whose destruction is justified. Re the result is always the same. People become more accepting to violence. Throughout the history, hate speech has spread according to the terms of the means of communication of the day and the development of printing press expanding its distribution platforms from market squares to books flyers, media of the time. Newspapers and electronic media played their own part in constructing images of the enemy during the World War II, and in 21st century, social media and internet took their place along, alongside the old platforms, making the distribution and targeting of the hate speech unprecedented in its effortlessness. When every social media user became a journalist of their own life, the amount of hate speech increased dramatically because reaching audiences and finding sounding boards became so easy and free. This low price is precisely the reason why Russia began throwing everything they had at developing the information influence repertoire. Because the goals of Russian power exceed its capacity to act as a real superpower, Due to this mismatch between ambition and actual ability, Russia has searched purposefully for means that are easy and effective, and this is why the struggle for the information space and psychological influence are so important to it. Manufacturing lies is cheap, using words is cheap, shouting down opponents is cheap, Demo denigrating democratic values is cheap, and technological developments are facilitating the adaptation of increasingly inexpensive instruments. The researcher Alina Polyakova has reminded us um, in the recent years of the opportunities that artificial intelligence, deep fakes and other synthetic media products offer Russia. While perhaps some looking in from the outside on the war of Ukraine laughed at the beginning at Russia's clumsy disinformation campaign soon, but soon it will be increasingly difficult to distinguish manipulated images from reality. Automated bots might maybe soon yesterday's news, replaced or joined by significantly more sophisticated impersonators. In the early days of the war in Ukraine, activists began to notice that same actors showing up all over in different pro-Russia demonstrations, playing the parts of ordinary citizens with different names and different roles. But soon recognizing paid performance like this will become more difficult. During the 2019 Ukrainian parliamentary elections, the country's intelligence service arrested a man who confessed to being a Russian agent whose job it was to get locals to either rent or sell their Facebook accounts. These would then be used to spread fake news. My reason for bringing up the past in this speech has not been to point a finger at the blindness of Western nations relative to Russia, but rather to remind us that developments in Russia are not changing direction. Their actions are intentional, long-term, and based on a tradition of expertise. 
After the Second World War, the Russians left Norway, and uh, just as did Germans. But now, today, Russia is not giving up its aggressive activities within the borders of our countries. The information warriors who serve Russia are not leaving, and their activities have become global. As we speak, Russia is expanding its operations, particularly in Africa. Their aggression is not directly only at the West. In addition to weakening the West, Russia seeks to build a post-truth world in which facts no longer have any meaning. And of course, to all of us who are products of democracy, this effort feels absurd. But the principle in the Western media of relying on facts is very young and not at all self-evident to all citizens of the world. A person who has grown up without media based on truthful information might not necessarily know how to miss its lack or believe that such thing is even possible. In developing countries, traditional media does not have the same kind of power as in Finland. Reading newspapers and seeing that as important requires a tradition. For example, growing up in a family where parents read the news. And this often means belonging to at least to middle class that can afford to buy newspapers and has time to read them. But for others, free services like Facebook can become, become synonymous with the entire internet. And every piece of information gushes from the screen can have the same value. So this, this is, of course, destructive, even without Russia, for whom operating in such an environment is very easy. So it is important that we continue to remind social media companies of their responsibility, which they would be happy to avoid. Here in Nordic countries, it can be easy to be indifferent to what Russia may be doing now in Africa, but the, that indifference is dangerous. During the Second World War, Germans took lessons from the Soviet concentration camps, and in the same way, Russia is now mentoring other authoritarian and totalitarian regimes. Similarly, Russia can sell its know-how to criminal and terrorist organizations whose activities know no borders. The development of Russia's information, information and psychological warfare capabilities are no longer only threat to Western democratic order. They are now a global threat. And Russia has gotten away scot-free with most of its operations, and it serves as a green light to other actors who wish to gnaw away the democratic system. Even if Russia is the main orchestrator of state-sponsored information influence operations right now, it isn't the only country with an interest in using these tools. China, Iran, Iran, other state or non-state actors have already taken lessons from the Russian arsenal, and they are using those weapons at ever-increasing rates. These threats affect us all. Thank you. Ms. Sophie Oxen, and thank you very much for a powerful speech that was a very, very strong finale uh, to a great event like this. Uh, and although this conference is, is slowly drawing to its end, I think we can have a few minutes for, uh, for just a little Q&A, if it's okay with you, Sophie. Uh, so why don't we open the discussion to the floor, if there's anything you would like to uh, ask or, or ask Sophie or comment on, on her presentation. Let's keep an eye on the message box as well, that we have our online okay. audience following this event as well. But yeah, let's take a question from there, from the front row, please. Hello, my name is Kaisa Lippon and I'm the chair of the board of uh, PROCOM. Thank you for a very inspiring and strong speech. Uh, very good. Uh, I was thinking that if you could change something to enhance the freedom of, of expression, what would you change? Um. I, I, I'd say that it, if, if I'd had a uh, magic wand to make every single person in the world to um, actually know who are they are voting for <laughs> uh, and not 
uh, and to make the, the decision about who to vote uh, based on facts and not feelings. Uh, it is understandable that humans do make their decisions based on feelings, but I have a feeling that they do it too often when they vote. So I, I would, I would uh, love to see every single person uh, uh, to be extremely obsessed, obsessed, now I'm using the word obsessed with uh, um, fact-checking what politicians are saying. I, I think that would already, like, you know, uh, make the difference if people would do that. And also, to, um, I have a feeling that quite many voters don't actually think that uh, the one vote matters, but it does. We've seen that it, it actually does. So um, perhaps self-confidence for the voters as well. It's very good. And we do have fact checkers in the audience as well, which is, <laughs> is a very good thing. Any, any other comments or questions? Anyone? Let me see. The, uh, it was powerful. Thank you, Sophie. It comes from the online audience. So uh, thanks from, from there as well. Uh, if there are no more questions here, I would like to ask, you mentioned that uh, the best antidotes for fake news and disinformation are sort of to, to think straight, uh, to be precise with your words yeah. and to have solid facts like you said. But all of these, they are, they are kind of easier, easier said than done. So mm -hmm. do you have any piece of advice for us how to think straight, have achieved that clarity of thought and that precision of expression? Any words of advice? Well, uh, be, being direct and using direct words uh, might make you an unpleasant person. Um, and uh, that is something that you have to bear, bear with, you know. Uh, being nice doesn't serve uh, peace nor democratic values. Uh, and uh, I think, well, especially women, women are supposed to, you know, be nice. Actually, it's, maybe it's easier for men who can be a little bit more aggressive. But if a woman is a direct, then... Uh, then it's considered like a bad thing. So I think this is a kind of equality question uh, in a way as well. But when I, um, I've written, um, well, quite many novels about uh, Soviet uh, and also about German occupation in Estonia. And uh, uh, when I was doing my background research, I was really uh, um, going through a lot of material and, and uh, also the uh, documents, archives, and what was, uh, what really struck me was the language, the language of occupation, which was surprisingly similar to both Soviet and German. One is that there was no one actually taking responsibility by their own name for certain decisions or orders, for example. It was always, the, the, the language has so, had so, so much passive form. So there was, it was very difficult to pinpoint that, okay, who gave this order actually? What was the, um, what was the uh, structure of that home, whole system? And uh, that's one thing that was also kind of blurring the personal responsibility. So in that way, that was clever. But I, I, I think in democratic, we have to know our personal um, responsibility, that every single person has a responsibility at least for one vote and the u words you are actually using. And, um, and, and also uh, what was t uh, typical of, of these uh, rhetorics of these regimes was, um, well, euphemisms is one, and um, and also um, repetition, a repetition, of course, repetition is always good propaganda, but, but in a way the language was not actually natural and it was not direct. And, um, and if you think about that kind of language, then it is definitely that what was building and constructing the reality. And I, I think being direct, no matter even though you might seem like unpolite or not like a nice person because unfortunately many things in the world are unpleasant so uh, bringing, bringing them up on the table is anyway a thing you have to you, you have to do simply so um, that's yeah you have to live with being not perhaps 
the a, nicest that, person in the room. That's a great <laughs> point. Since, uh, <laughs> Professor Mayarita Olila began today by saying that uh, uh, dialogue or you know communication is uh, is a combination of truthfulness and love. So I guess we need to uh, yeah. toughen up a little bit yeah. uh, for for the good reason. Uh, Christina Forskod was asking online, like, what are the best ways to fight against the disinformation? I, we just kind of recap that a little bit. But uh, Anne Gregory, professor uh, from Huddersfield, UK, one of our panelists earlier today asks, if one vote is so precious, should voting be compulsory in a democracy? What would you say? Well, I say actually yes to that. Compulsory voting? I say, yeah, but no. Um, so perhaps, we'll uh, find the ones who don't vote. Um, perhaps if I was younger, I might have said differ differently. Um, but at this point, um, at this moment, I think, yes, that would be a good, good thing. But also, <laughs> at the same time, perhaps there should be like few questions to those who want to vote that actually do you know who you are voting? Well, in, in yeah, yeah. In that case, tell me. That, tell, that makes it yeah. very complicated, actually. Well, in that case, tell me how how can we get our facts straight so that we can make fact-based decisions? Because today we have, time and again, seen examples of how hard it is to come by with straight facts because we don't know what to believe. We don't know what, you know, we have deep fake all these yeah. things that we've talked about. How do we get straight facts? Uh, well, I, I guess we would need more money for fact-checking, simply. I'm afraid media doesn't have enough resources. So, uh, uh, so um, I, I mean, uh, especially now with uh, this weird situation with the virus, we know that the economy is not doing well, but still I'm hoping that truthfulness would be considered like a very important tool of defense and it should be considered as such, and therefore also it should have some, a bit bigger bu budget, because it is one of the most precious things we have, actually. As a journalist, I'm very glad to hear that. Uh, just l last time I was checking if we have any, any uh, further questions, because I would like to, uh, no, I would like to, Sophie, end on a personal note. Uh, you told us that you've been through a lot. You've experienced uh, all kinds of, let's say, unethical behavior, like you described. What has helped you over the years, given you strength and courage to keep on doing what you do, keep on talking about uh, ethics and democracy and defending them? Well, um, one, one thing uh, is that I have... Um, I, has, I have seen the impossible, and that is when Estonia and other Baltic states actually regained the independence. When I was born, nobody believed that it could actually happen. Uh, of course, the, those who fled to Western countries, um, they did keep alive the dream and they, I, I mean, um, this is a typical migrant tale, quite many uh, diaspora Estonian communities, they wanted their children to, to become doctors or lawyers because, you know, when the country regains the independence, the country, the independent state is going to need doctors and lawyers. But those who were living in the Soviet Union, they did not see that coming at all. And, uh, but it did happen. And actually, all those things that were smuffled and, uh, and um, like, for example, uh, deportations. When, when I was a child, we couldn't use direct words uh, about, about deportations uh, or, or gulag at all. And you could only have a conversation with, uh, well, in Estonia, there's a saying, this is a conversation you have to have between four eyes, and that is only, you know, face to face with the person you trust, and preferably outside, not inside. So, um, so I have seen that it is actually possible that things, that uh, tyrannies do collapse. And that the, so this is, this is probably some, something that has affected me a lot, that I have seen the impossible. So I believe in impossible things as well. well Sophie, Sophie, thank you very much for your visit. Thank you for the keynote and thank you for all that invaluable insight on the freedom of expression. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Ms. Sophie Oksanen.